this is our actually season finale, our seventh season of Scripted Screens, wrapping up tonight. Uh, it's been a great year. We have some fun things planned for eighth season, so stay tuned for details. But what better way to end this year with Royal Tannenbaum with our very special guest? Just, just a few snippets of her career. Um, we have Heart 8. Did anybody see Heart 8? Oh, we have one student in the audience. Heart 8, we have Sylvia, Emma, Shakespeare in Love, which you won an Oscar for. <laughs> of, of, of course, Royal Tannenbaums. Uh, my personal favorite, Emma. And, you know, for the past 10 years, she's been playing Pepper Potts on the Marvel Universe. And, of course, she can now be seen in Avengers Affinity War. How many people have not seen the movie, have lived in a cave for the past two months? <laughs> Only a few people are doing that. So, well, let's please welcome our special guest, Gwen Patro, Oscar winning actress. <laughs> well, <Royal Tannenbaum. laughs> Oh, this is your water? Thank you. <laughs> wow. Thanks so much for coming. Thanks for having so, me. This is great. So, um, How was the movie? <laughs> <laughs> well, let's ask that. Well, you and I watched about 10 minutes of it. Uh, what did you guys think of watching it uh, today? <laughs> I mean, you know, just, uh, we briefly talked how most of the students here, of course, have only seen it on the computer. How was it kind of, kind of sharing it with the audience again, seeing it for the first time when I was 18 years? It w well, it was good. I actually uh, saw it. We had a 10th anniversary uh -huh. screening at Lincoln Center, so, and that's the last time I saw it. But it must be 20 years old now. I don't know how long. I think it was 2001, 2001. Uh, the program. It was... Uh, so, and what's it like coming home to UCSB? Because <laughs> you spent great. some time here before uh, yeah. Hollywood stole you away from us. <laughs> oh, it's great. I think this is such a special place. And I was very fortunate to be a student here for a while until I left to pursue an acting career. Um, it's changed a lot. It's so fancy now. Jeez. <laughs> <laughs> when I was here, it was just like it was more... It was a little rough around the edges. So <laughs> I hope the burritos are still there at the place in Isla Vista. <laughs> are they guys, students? <laughs> yeah, they still have it. Uh, <laughs> you know, Isla Vista, I don't know if it's changed that much, but the campus has. Yeah. <laughs> um, all right, so we're going to go back a little in time. Okay. Uh, Royal Tannenbaum's is not exactly a traditional screenplay that you were probably accustomed to reading at the time. Right. Margot Ta Tannenbaum's description, which we put on our program, is hair being dyed, little clamps of foil twisted in, she blows smoke rings, has one fake finger made of wood. <laughs> After reading that script for the first time, how was preparing for this kind of role when you see something like that? <laughs> you know, it was really amazing because, as subsequently proven by Wes Anderson, he's really a very specific auteur. And he has the whole movie in his head. So you sit down to have a meeting. I remember when I first met him in New York City in Soho for lunch. And he said, and we, I had agreed to do the film. And he said, you know, your hair is going to look like this. And you're wearing this kind of eyeliner. And you're going to be wearing an Izod tennis dress with a fur coat. And I was like, what do you mean I'm going to be wearing? Like, <laughs> do I get a say in this? And he was like, no. <laughs> But normally, like, uh, we'll talk some of your other traditional scripts a little later, but normally you probably get a pretty good idea of what the character, the tone of the movie yeah. is. It but was Wes so Anderson clear. didn't exist, though, in that day. Like, it was his new role. That's true. So did you have a little difficulty originally? Like, I don't understand this. You need to talk to Wes to kind of like, oh, I, you know. I mean, it was so clear, the tone. And, he, and then his brother, Eric, draws all, who does all the mm. drawings in the film, he kind of showed me this book of all of Eric's drawings, and he really created the world so specifically, and the tone of the movie is really specific. There were certain things I didn't totally get, <laughs> and <laughs> I remember, because it's sort of a funny cadence, you know, and mm. there are weird pauses, it's just sort of odd. And I remember I had a couple of moments on set where I thought, like, are we making the worst movie of all time? <laughs> <laughs> But well, luckily, it turned out to be pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> well, it seems like one of those movies where you have to have full trust in the director going in. For sure. Uh, I mean, you have to on a movie like that, where it's 
just so off in a way. And if you don't have complete trust, then you shouldn't be there. You know, Gene Hackman actually had a really hard time with it. He um, didn't get it. Like he and he didn't <laughs> he didn't understand what was happening, and like he didn't trust Wes, and so it was pretty interesting. <laughs> uh, we actually had the production designer, uh, designer Adam Stockhausen a couple years ago for Grand Budapest. It does seem like the production design is a character in Wes's movies. Yeah. So it does seem like the part. Of, it seems like the crew is even more of a part of the movie than sometimes the other movies. For sure. Uh, also, if I'm not mistaken, you knew the music going in. Yeah. yeah. So was that, that they were all, he said, oh, and when you walk off the bus, it'll be slow motion and this Nico song will be playing. And like he just, I'm telling you, he comes with a complete movie, it's done in his head, and then we just have to execute it on the day. <laughs> <laughs> now, I also heard a rumor that there was some difficulty maybe getting the rights to a Beatles song. Oh, yeah. That you were recruited. Yes. That entailed bowling, <laughs> if I'm not yes. mistaken. That's true. <laughs> oh, my gosh. You're really reminding me. So, Wes was having trouble getting the rights to a Beatles song for the very end of the film. And so he said to me, I need you to deal with this and call Paul McCartney. And <laughs> I was like, I don't know, Paul, what? Like, what, how is this my job? But he knew that I'm very close with Paul's daughter, Stella. So embarrassingly enough, I had to call Stella to say, can I speak to your dad <laughs> on behalf of Wes Anderson? And she was like, oh, he's in East Hampton, and you are too, and like, he wants to go bowling. <laughs> so, <laughs> myself and Luke Wilson, who was my boyfriend at the time, went bowling with Paul, and I can't remember who the woman was he was with at that point, but we went bowling in East Hampton, <laughs> and I suppose I, can, I must have convinced him to let us use the song. <laughs> it's in the movie, so. <laughs> All right, so get a little back. So, when you talked a little about the tone, how do you approach a role where you, you worried about the comedy? drowning out the drama, but the drama could weigh down the comedy, and especially at this. So how do you yeah. kind of prepare for something to find that perfect balance? Especially this is razor thin yeah, line. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, I think you just have to sort of find it internally, like you just develop your own kind of scale for it pretty quickly. And for me, as soon as I understand, I think, you know, it was just kind of hard to get the tone initially, and then uh, very quickly, I kind of got it, and then, uh, and Wes was great, and you know, he, he knows exactly what he wants, so if there was ever a moment where I felt like, oh, I don't get it, he would just say, you know, just do it like that, ah. so. which was very helpful. <laughs> <laughs> uh, last month, we had Lorraine Newman, original Center Live cast member in your chair for our Women in Comedy series. She was amazing, That's and she awesome. said working with Bill Murray was surreal because he's the greatest comedic talent she ever worked with, and she worked with everybody. Yeah. But you had the opposite experience because his comedy was so, he was actually very dramatic, so how was working yeah. with Bill, but mostly in dramatic? It was great. I loved him so much. He's so brilliant and grumpy and awesome. <laughs> <laughs> and we, when he's, you know, even, uh, there was one scene we were doing and he just did this funny, I don't even know what it was, it was so subtle and I ruined about 12 takes. I mean, his comedy is so powerful. He's amazing. Uh, but did you ask Wes, maybe can I have a fun scene, or can we do a Ghostbusters <laughs> rehash or anything? Oh, I was very happy with our... <laughs> I just felt bad because I was so mean to him in the movie. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You did have a lot of bathtub scenes, especially in the opening. Was any difficulty working uh, comedy in a bathtub, from a bathtub? No, I'm, I'm a bathtub girl. <laughs> <laughs> it's interesting because you touched on Gene Hackman, uh, which was the opposite. He did mostly dramatic roles yeah. and comedy, and you did have that really interesting scene where the ice cream shop scene that always got me, yeah. where he doesn't remember your name. You played as a joke originally, but doesn't remember his mother's name. How do you straddle that kind of line? Because Gene Hackman is a dramatic actor. Yeah. How would you approach something like that yeah. with him? I think you just have to be really, for me anyway, I don't know about his side, but I just played it as if it were real and what that would be like. And I think underneath it, you, can, you, you know there's an undercurrent, undercurrent of very dark humor. Um, but in, in that case, I just played it straight, you know, and how crushing, crushing and yet 
unsurprising it was to her. Yeah, I mean, the, his constant referred to as adopted daughter, yeah. which was a running gag until that moment. Right. We knew <laughs> the, the cost of it. But you did say, so Gene did wrestle a little with the tone? Like finding yeah, the balance more than you guys, you know, Gwen, you and Ben and the others yes, jumped in? Yes, And it's weird. I mean, you know, f to be fair to him, it is a weird, it was at the time. I mean, now you could say, oh, it's like a Wes Anderson tone and people would understand. But at the time, he was inventing this kind of cinematic vernacular. And it was weird. And, you know, I think Gene was just totally unused to it and totally unused to a director who was as specific as, as Wes was. And so... There were certain days where it was a little touching. Yeah, yeah thank you. <laughs> but the two of you, I mean, definitely hit it off on the screen. That's what I noticed about yeah. it. Like, you had a lot of good moments. Oh, he had great moments. Well, Angelica. We got along very well, Gene and I. I mean, I, I really have an incredible amount of respect for him, and he was lovely to me. Um, um, and I just felt like I learned so much from watching him. I mean, the cast was so incredible. Oh, uh, yeah, amazing. And that leads to Angelica Houston, one of my all-time favorite yeah. actresses. Now, she did some offbeat roles, Adam's Family, if people remember. Mm -hmm. So she had some experience with that. What was special about working with her? Oh, she's just so fabulous. She's so elegant and, and yet yeah, kind of punk rock, and she's had this amazing <laughs> life. And we, we girls, we had this makeup trailer, and there were sort of like five stations down here and then one up the stairs, and they called it the nest, and that was Angelica's area. And um, <laughs> she was just so cool. She would, you know, sm at the end of the day, she'd be getting her makeup off, uh, makeup off up there and having a cigarette and a glass of white wine, and <laughs> it's just like, oh, let me end up just like you. <laughs> Uh, just curious, so roughly how long was the shoot? I don't know if you remember, it was just, was it a, it wasn't a, I know it wasn't a full Hollywood, Gosh. it was more of an indie type. A few months. Oh, so you it did was, have time. Yeah, it was did, definitely a few months. Did you have rehearsal time? I don't think so. Oh. No, I think it was just sort of like, get chucked into the fire. <laughs> That would have been a little nice to get a few weeks with the <laughs> others. Uh, now, in the entertainment industry, they say don't work with, work with a kid because it's difficult working with kids. You decided to work with two kids and terrifying them with your story of cutting off your finger. How was working with the kids in a kind of a Wes Anderson movie? It was great. They were, they were, they were all totally great and professional and excited to be there. And um, so crazy. I was somewhere recently, and one of the boys that plays Ben's kid came up to me where was I? I was like I don't know he was a he was like hi I'm and I and he looked almost exactly the same just, <laughs> you know 20 years older <laughs> all right so we got to talk Luke Wilson is really your central relationship you're yeah. Luke Wilson so let's dive into the scene you're playing records dealing with Richard's suicide attempt mm -hmm. Richie's of course and the minor issue of pseudo incest yep uh, how did you one, guys. how did you one. guys work that that scene together I think it's such a beautiful tragic love story because you know you have this what is essentially forbidden love between siblings for all intents and purposes and yes they're not blood related but to grow up in a house together uh, as children and imagine the complications that that would bring. Um, and it's just so sad and I, I feel like she's part of her brokenness is that she can't essentially marry her brother. <laughs> yeah. um, and his too. And it's this very tragic vein that runs through the film. I was impressed with the little moment when you, uh, when you, you, know, you asked him, is it my fault? He right. was something like, you know, he might have blamed. He's like, yes, but it's not your fault. Right. That to me was the most tender moment of uh, the moment between the two of you. Uh, I did like the record player too, though. Yeah, <laughs> they're both really good scenes. Uh, all right, so now in the um, this part of the Q and A, we go for the script screen hardball question. Oh golly! Okay. So we try. We go easy, softball, okay. and now we go for the hard one. Uh, okay. So which actor took less takes to get the scene done, Luke Wilson or the Falcon? <laughs> you know, that falcon, it was a very errant falcon, I have to say. I think Luke Wilson was in less takes. <laughs> so the falcon wasn't a problem on set, or? The falcon, you know, animals are always slightly tricky, but it was okay. He was pretty well behaved. <laughs> the, uh, 
Sadly, you didn't have a lot of scenes with Ben Stiller, though. That would have been kind of interesting to explore. Me? Yeah, like a lot of it. Uh, you had some together. Yes, in a group. Yeah, it's true. So I was wondering, so how do you take, you got you have Ben Stiller, Luke Wilson, you're all kind of young in the business, you have the actors, so how did that ensemble just figure out a way to pull this movie off? I mean, it's, at the end of the day, it's so, it's so hard to articulate why. You know, mm. I think we had a great script and a great director, and we had, you know, and, and also Luke and Owen, um, and Wes were like a little triumvirate, and they had done multiple films together, they grew yeah. up together, so it's kind of like stepping into their weird secret language, and Owen co-wrote some of you this with him, and, um, and so it was kind of like going into a little fraternity and just like understanding their vibe and then kind of diving into that. I find it interesting because Act 3 is kind of revolving around you. Uh, uh, Eli, you dumped uh, Eli, yeah. so he was heartbroken, Luke was heartbroken, uh, and the whole conflict coming together. <laughs> Emotional wreckage. <laughs> Emotional wreckage. Uh, so for, for you, the, so the whole climax don't of Don't forget my husband, he was very, the more warm, You dumped, yeah. you, you dumped Bill Murray. Yeah. I mean, that, what, what, what is that? Uh, it was just interesting because I was watching the scene with the car, the dog, and you were, you were laughing it up. So what, when you see that, do you enjoy just like watching all the others? Yeah. And what they're doing. For sure. And so many memories, too, you know. My best friend since kindergarten plays uh, Ben Stiller's secretary. Oh. So I just saw her there in the end. Um, she's like my sister. So it was great. It was just fun to see that. So, all right, so we're going to go back a little in some of your career. Okay. Uh, but before we jump to that, what, what, growing up, which actresses, either comedic or dramatic, inspired you? Well, my mother, you know, first and foremost, my mother was, was and is an incredible actor, and she did lots of theater when I was growing up, so I would constantly just, my favorite thing to do was to watch her rehearse plays, and uh, she would go to the Williamstown Theater Festival in the Berkshires every summer and do two plays back to back, we'd be there the whole time, you know, and she was always doing... Chekhov or Shakespeare or Tennessee Williams or some extraordinarily empowered female role and um, and I just wanted to be like that you know she was quite timid off stage in a way and sort of she felt like her whole self on stage and so that's what I wanted to be and did that so that that upfront training must have helped you kind of you know focus on theater first in your early part yeah of your career. I think. I just, that's just what I wanted to do. I, I didn't think about film. I, I wanted to play all those roles that she had played. And, um, and so I, I followed in her footsteps. I went to Williamstown and I started doing theater. Oh, wow. But your dad, producer, director of great television and film, so that kind of maybe helped you a little on the film side? Well, then I was at Williamstown doing a play, and someone spotted me and started to send me out for movies, and then it felt very exciting. And then I remember I was, I had finished my freshman year at UCSB, and I went back to Williamstown to do a play, and I had auditioned for a film. And I remember, you know, it was before cell phones or anything, so there was like a note on the theater pin board <laughs> saying that I had gotten this role so that so at that point I decided not to come back here and to pursue it and film felt you know really exciting because it was it, it still felt like I was carrying on what my parents did but at the time my mother was predominantly a film I mean a theater actor and my father was in television so it felt like I was kind of carving out my own area in the family and at the same time your brother got into the industry too so uh -huh. were you ultimately both destined for it or you just, it was just something I don't know I think you know I think it was a very cool, interesting way to grow up with a lot of artists and writers and it was a vibrant house full of amazing people and so I think, and also there's something, there's something really freeing about channeling for a living, you know, it's very, you kind of feel like it gives you great agency because you're just, your job is to sort of channel this crazy energy and, and, and turn it into something and you're kind of using your body as that instrument and I just love doing it for a really long time. And so you mentioned the theater so that must have helped kind of prepare you for Emma. 
Yeah. Yeah, one of your. Yeah. Uh, I heard you say you like that one. <laughs> I just want to, it's actually, that I, it was uh, growing up, it was my first movie introduced you to you. And then I went back, you know, Heart Eight, all the others, and they were great. Oh, thanks. And of course, your you droll and hook. Oh, yes, so. of course. <laughs> my one line is <laughs> uh, So, but then we go to Shakespeare in Love. Right. All right. And we, that was the biggest applause line uh, there. Oh. So you deal with a play within a play, comedy, romance, drama, gender flips, playing Romeo and Juliet, and an accent. Yes. What was the process of trying to get all that together yeah. and prepping for that role? It was like there were a lot of balls in the air, no <laughs> pun intended. Or maybe pun intended because I had balls in my <laughs> pants when I played the guy. <laughs> um, it was an amazing experience. It was, I had no idea at the time we were making such an incredible movie. Um, I thought we were making this tiny little independent movie about Shakespeare. I never imagined anybody would actually go and see it. Um, and it was a fabulous experience and very complicated role and lots of hair and makeup and corsets and all that. Okay, now we're at Script the Screen Hardball question two. Okay. Uh, Here. All right, Shakespeare in Love pulled off one of the biggest Oscar Best Picture surprises in history. Yeah. Everybody expected, you know, you, I mean, you know, the, act, the production designer script, everything, which was all amazing, but you defeated Save It Private Ryan, which yes. was the inevitable. So has your godfather, Steven Spielberg, forgiven you? <laughs> I think so. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's funny. I know at the time it was, um, it was a big surprise, but, and they're both beautiful films, but I think, you know, Shakespeare in Love is so so unique. There have been a lot of incredible films about war, and I think there haven't been a lot of yeah. incredible films about a theater or about Shakespeare. And um, and so they were just very very different. And at the end of the day, I mean, we were surprised. We didn't expect it. Yeah, and it is because you think of Tom Stoppard's script, it's how he weaved it into you, like the real life yeah. blending into it was. It is flawless. the most flawless script I've ever read. I've never, I've never read anything that's close to that in terms of all the little inside jokes and the, you know, and then sort of tipping off Twelfth Night at the end of it, yep. and it was just amazing. All right, so we're gonna take a slight detour, okay. a, a movie that's a, a hair less comedic than your other roles. All right. Seven. Yes. <laughs> So what was, because again, David Fincher, emerging filmmaker, kind of like yes. Wes, new to it, you had Brad Pitt, Morgan Freeman. Yeah. How was that process of getting to that movie, which was a, a very darker tone? Yes. Well, that was before, wasn't it? So I, I was staying at my parents' house in Santa Monica, and my agents called and said, there's a very small part in the thriller uh, starring Brad Pitt, and I said, sign me up. <laughs> <laughs> and then I read it, and I was like, holy sh**. <laughs> <laughs> but I did it anyway. <laughs> well, it was interesting, because uh, yeah, I, I, it was one of my favorite movies, actually, and I was watching it again. There's some humor, especially in the dinner scene with Morgan Freeman. You're actually having fun and banter with him. Brad's actually kind of not, he's a straight guy in the theory. So in a movie like that, do you have to find some light just for you, you, some comedic light, just to ground the dark side of the story? I think in that case, you know, we were just trying to show some real domesticity, and I think her character was a pretty light character, and she was meant to sort of be a little ray of sunshine in this very dark world, and, you know, I just play what's there, you know? <laughs> <laughs> but you also got to play the great scene with Morgan Freeman at the yeah, diner, uh, deciding on your child. That, yeah. that scene always kind of touched me the most. Yeah. You know. God, that's really a brutal movie, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, okay, so we talked a little bit about great scripts. Obviously, yeah. great scripts is the, the start, but sometimes lightning in the bottle just happens with our character chemistry. It's the 10th yeah. anniversary of Iron Man. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so you and, I, you and Robert Downey Jr. kind of just explode off the screen. Your relationship, the way you interacted with each other, especially, Thanks. you know, from start on. How did you guys, was, how did you guys create that kind of dynamic? Or you just... That movie is improv I mean, the oh. Iron Man one, it was pretty crazy. I mean, it was really fun, but um, Robert is the most, like, 
irrepressible genius and very uncontained in his enthusiasm in certain ways, which is great. Um, but he would come in every morning and we would take the sides and then he would rip them up and say like, I'm not saying any of that shit. <laughs> and I'd be like, okay. And then we would go into John Favreau's trailer and the three of us would like rewrite it. And it was, you know, it was very, um, it was, I felt very alive and very sort of scared in a way. And I was like, you can't make a movie like this. Like this is, <laughs> this is nuts. Um, but I think there was just something about it that worked. And I mean, we improv every scene. It was pretty, it was very fly by the seat of the pants, but it was, it was fun. And I guess in that situation, you definitely need, a, you need a, a, a way. You just have to connect with the actor, the fellow actor. You're just not going to be able to find that balance yeah. unless you two I just, just hit it off. I just followed him. I just, whatever he did, I just tried to keep up with him, basically. <laughs> but in Iron Man 3, you got to actually kind of do some superhero fighting. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so was that kind of fun? Like, you know, let's get out of the boardroom and kind of uh, yeah, that punch was some great. stuff. Yeah, that great. I still don't totally understand the plot and why... <laughs> <laughs> What happened to me that I became, I don't get it really, but um, it was really super fun. And, um, it was great. And then I got to kill the bad guy. I mean, that was very cool. You did? That's that, I did. Yeah. You also saved him. I did? Tony, yeah. Oh. Yeah. So it, it was. Uh... I find these hard to follow, these movies. <laughs> I don't know what that says about me, but I just tried to watch Avengers 3. Three. And I was like, what the hell is going on? <laughs> I mean, it was enjoyable, but did anyone understand the plot of that one? Yeah, he did. Okay. <laughs> always, the, I need uh, to come back to UCSB, clearly. <laughs> Get a degree so I can understand freaking Avengers movies. <laughs> We won't ask about the new one because we know uh, it was a big cliffhanger, so... Oh. Yeah. But, uh, all right, that's a tiny question. Okay. Do you know what happens? I do. Okay, that's it. There was uh, no other questions about, but you know what happens. I, I definitely know what happens. <laughs> yeah. Hey, all right, so. <laughs> it's only, it's, you only have to wait a year. I think it's coming out in May. It's coming out in May, yeah, next yeah. May. So it was, uh, but you know, the Marvel Universe, I mean, obviously it dominate, it's been dominating the box office. More importantly, the, it's one of the most passionate fan bases yeah. you know, I've ever seen. It's pretty great. What's it been like being part of Cultural Phenomenon? Because if the fans do love and embrace it more yeah, than any other movies so out there. It's so cool. I mean, I've never, I had never experienced anything like that. You know, I think when you, when you do a film and people like it, and it comes out and then it goes away and that was that. And there's something about being in the Marvel Universe, Marvel Cinematic Universe, excuse me, <laughs> um, where you're just a part of this like huge quilt. And it's kind of constantly being added to. And you're important little pieces of the patchwork. And people don't forget that you were, you know, like, People are passionate about Pepper Potts, you know, so. Uh, I especially was a kind of moved about the story a couple of years ago, Ryan Wilcox. Oh, was like the story. how did you know about that? Yeah, it, well, you t yeah it was. I it, guess it was in, yeah. Yeah, but, but, well, you guys didn't publicize it that much. You, you, it was a special. Uh, Ryan Wilcox was dying of cancer, so when it found out and arranged for Robert Downey and Chris Evans to visit, and you all visited with that. Mm -hmm. How was something for that knowing experience, what, you, what it actually could? Is that so like hands-on, what it actually can impact a child? It was so heartbreaking and very special. And I, someone tagged me on an Instagram post saying, um, please, can anyone help me? My friends, you know, my, my friend is in the hospital. He's 17 and all he wants is to meet Robert Downey and Chris Evans, he's obsessed with, um, I forget the name of the, the character of Chris Evans, you know, the... Steve Rogers, Captain America. Thank you. He's obsessed with Captain America and, and Iron Man. And so I, I called Robert and I was like, we have to go see this kid. And he was like, I, I want to, but I have this and I have that. And I was like, get your ass 
to the... <laughs> And I literally, I forced Chris Evans and Robert, and we got in a helicopter, and we went down to San Diego, and we spent a couple of hours with this young man, and it was extraordinary. It just was. It also must have been a special moment for the mother, be able to, like, see what the impact it had on her child. Yeah. That was. And, and, her, and, and the father, and it was very special, and unfortunately, he since passed away. Um... Uh, so, uh, uh, let's talk about... And on that upper... <laughs> well, we're actually going to go a little upper. Uh, Glee. So, oh. how is preparing for a recurring world <laughs> different from working on, you know, your normal film roles? And you can sing the answer if you want. <laughs> um, that was a lot of fun. I mean, I think one of, the, one of the hard things about doing film is that the pace is really slow. So, mm. if you're a person that was like gets itchy, you know, you're sitting in your trailer for most of the day. Like, you're sitting around for most of the time. And when I did Glee, it was the opposite. I mean, they, you work from the second you get there till the second you leave, and it was just, it seemed impossible to me. I'd never really done TV or not in years and years, and I was like, what do you mean we're doing, like, 10 pages in one day? Like. <laughs> How is that possible? And you would do a big, huge musical number and then break for lunch and move on to something else. And, you know, in, in a movie, that would take two weeks to yeah. shoot. So I loved it, and I loved my crazy character, Holly Holiday, the <laughs> substitute teacher. And it was great. It was really fun. <laughs> uh, did you do singing when you were younger, or was it...? I did sing when I was younger. I, um, I, I, I grew up singing. Always, and uh, I sang in you know high school and stuff like that, and and uh, so I was happy to. It's always fun when I get to do it a little bit, you know, in film roles and stuff like that. And uh, the little yeah, we talked a little about the Marvel impact, Lee's impact. I mean, it is a show that opened the door for a lot of different voices, it, and that's it really what's so special did. about. It. This is one of the reasons it connected to the audiences more than a lot of other shows. For sure, I think Glee and Modern Family premiered the same year. And I think that was sort of a one-two punch against th this dying, conventional, prejudicial way of seeing, you know, that families had to be a certain, look a certain way. And uh, so I was very proud to be a part of it. I think it was, it really moved culture forward. So, all right, so I, I, I want you to actually give our audience a homework assignment. Okay. What role, of all your roles you've had, maybe not the, you know, the obvious Shakespeare, the ones we all know, would you say, you know, go back and watch. It's something special that didn't maybe get as much of, you know, the big theatrical re release. I think the work that I'm most proud of that's sort of the littlest scene is the movie about Sylvia Plath. Uh -huh. yeah. um, it just was depressing, so... I think it wasn't a blockbuster, <laughs> but uh, I think it's a beautiful film, and um, and it's with Daniel Craig, who then mm -hmm. went on to be James Bond, and uh, he plays Ted Hughes, and it's a really beautiful film. I think it's sad, but I'm very proud of it. So we do have uh, okay. So this is a little pause. We do have a lot of graduates, students graduating. Congratulations! Uh, yeah, this year. Uh, special to Morgan and Allie. They've been with me for two years, done about 100 of these events with me, and oh I couldn't God. have survived without them. So That's it's sad that they're leaving us. But what, what, uh, what advice can you give to women, like for example, women students breaking into the industry right now? Yeah. Well, I think the good news is it's a great time for women to be entering the industry, and I think um, Everybody's very aware of the inequality that's existed, so there are a lot of initiatives coming from the top. So all heads of studios are saying, we want half our crews to be women, we want half of the directors on a TV show to be women, we want more women screenwriters. So I think it's a, I think it's a really good time. I think you just have to figure out what it is exactly you want to do and just hold that in laser focus and just bang down the doors and make it happen. Interesting, so I asked you to put on your CEO hat a second. Okay. For Goop, from Goop. Uh, so we have, <laughs> well, <laughs> Thank you. Uh, So obviously, you know, there's a lot of competition graduating. So is there any specific trait you're looking for? Because you have people with not a lot of resumes. 
you know, in any of the entertainment or non-entertainment industry. Is there something that stands out for you, like when you're meeting somebody who's younger, like, oh my God, that's the reason I want that person? Or? Yeah, I think, um, you know, we actually hire a lot of people out of college and that we have a lot of people at the company that it's their first job out of college. And I think, um, I think we, we always look for people who are self-possessed and articulate and, and who also are, you know, not too kind of, I'm acting the way you're supposed to act in an interview, you know, like bring your, bring your, per, bring yourself to it. And, you know, I think we always are looking for people that we think like, ah, oh, you know, she's got that spark of creativity and, um, and some passion. And so I think it's important that I think sometimes, you know, people come in and they're nervous and they're trying not to say the wrong thing. And I think sometimes that's a hindrance. Okay, so we do always end our show with the same question. Okay. Uh, what movie or role, movie or role, would you say is an inspiration to you growing up? Like, would you say, "Wow, this was a quintessential movie or role that oh, I loved and inspired me"? Gosh, there's so many. Um, I think there are a few. Can I? Do I have to say? Please one? no. I'm okay. okay. Well, um, I remember. And this is sort of strange because it's uh, not really, a, I mean, it's a documentary. But I remember seeing uh, Truth or Dare, the documentary about Madonna when I was a, se a senior in high school. And I just thought she was so, um, like, again, fiercely herself and so brave. And, um, and I thought, I... I, I felt incredibly inspired by that new model of kind of mm -hmm. female empowerment. Um, so that was one. I remember, you know, all of Meryl Streep's movies growing up. I mean, she's always been, you know, I think she's the best living actor. Um, I really loved Daryl Hannah and Splash. <laughs> 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 it was one of my favorite movies. And... Uh, you know, so like a bunch of 80s movies and, you know, all the stuff that I had growing up. Pretty Woman, too. I, that came out when I was a senior in high school. Oh, I right know. Right on the same. Yeah, that was a, that was a huge movie yeah. that it really it connected with a lot of audiences. People went back over and over again. Yeah. It was mm -hmm. uh, Julia Roberts. Um, have, have you seen the movie, by the way? All right. Everybody's seen Pretty Woman. I always check, you know, sometimes our students are, you know, <laughs> but definitely go out and see it. <laughs> well, as I mentioned, it's our season finale of Script to Screen, and we're closing out our Women in Comedy series. So films like Royal Tenenbaums is a, was a great way to close it. Thanks. And thank you, for, you know, your inspiration to our soon-to-be writer and directors. Oh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for having me. And of course, anytime you want to come back, please come back. I would show love anything to. you would love to show, and you know, That's we'd so love to nice. chat more with you. Thank you so much. Oh, I appreciate it. Thanks yeah. for having me. <laughs>